join me in welcoming once again to the platform, Yvonne Johnson. With a warm applause, please. Good morning, everybody. Uh, happy Workers' Day. I'm grateful to Pastor Koju and Pastor Toy for having me back at the platform. It's really an honor to speak to this audience. The punchline for my talk today is intellectual curiosity. So if you forget, nothing, if you forget everything that you hear today, if you remember nothing else, I want to make the argument that intellectual curiosity is that way that you innovate in the future. You know? And so if you have your notepads, you can write it down. Uh, if you want to remember it in brackets, just put amebo because it's the same sort of uh, thing. <laughs> You know, today's topic is about innovating our way into the future. And all of us are joined together by being entrepreneurs, having an, um, a knack for enterprise, intrapreneurs as well. And so looking at this topic, the way that I want to structure it is just to deep dive into three different areas. One is to take a step back and say, look, what really is our role as entrepreneurs and intrapreneurs? Things are changing so fast, there's a lot of things that are moving, right, you know, and so we really need to take a step back and say, look, what is that role, right, you know, and more importantly, how do we, what defines success? Uh, the second part of it is really looking at an attempt at predicting the future, and that is the most practical application of intellectual curiosity. You really cannot innovate for the future unless you, you know, take a stab at predicting it accurately. Um, and lastly, we look at what is that required innovation? You know, as Nigerian African entrepreneurs, what is that innovation that is required, right? You know, uh, because we desperately need, you know, these successes. And we as entrepreneurs are the ones to create it. And so the first thing we look at is our roles, right? What is our role as entrepreneurs? What is our role as intrapreneurs? You know, I used to be an entrepreneur. And you know, I think it's, it's, it's very inno innovative to, to exclude that out um, you know, in the platform this year, right? Really talking about entrepreneurship, it's very important, right? Um, and and we, we have a lot of definitions and a lot of people are gonna deep dive into that. Uh, but very simply, an entrepreneur is an entrepreneur within an organization. Um, you're essentially driving innovation and growth within organizations. Your role is to identify and develop new products, new services, uh, and business models. You know, the difference between an intrapreneur um, and a regular employee is that you're actively seeking these new opportunities, right? You're actively seeking ways that you can create value. And so this role, as well as the role of an entrepreneur, you know, it's, it has a large surface area. There's a lot of ways, things that you have to do. Right, you know, there's the idea generation part, right? You know, that's important. What's the vision? What's the idea, right? You know, uh, building structure. You don't get to any level of scale without that, right? So the structure, this process that you have to build. Uh, managing people, that's, you know, an important part of the role as well, right? But, you know, both roles require visionary leadership. It's, you know, you're given, in, you're given to see something that has, do, does not yet exist. And you, know, you have this future of the image that you have cultivated, and a lot of your work involves getting others to buy into that vision and really getting them to invest uh, in the efforts um, towards it. And so how do you structure your life? Knowing that you know, having that visionary capacity is important in these roles, right? How do you structure your life so that this visionary capacity continues to increase? And that's where intellectual curiosity comes from. That's where the curiosity about your industry, about what the future looks like, and about where the opportunities are gonna come from. Intellectual curiosity is about asking the right questions so that you can accurately fill in the gaps. Because like we said, with this role, it has a large surface area. There's a lot that you're thinking about, right? You know? But you have to be curious enough to be able to ask the right questions so that the right insight and the right wisdom bubbles up, right? And so practically, how, how do you develop this? What, what, what is a practical way of doing this? Um, and it's very simple. One of the things is just reading, right? Um, you know, reading a lot, reading widely. Um, and nowadays, you know, because of technology, reading also means, you know, audio books and, you know, YouTube channels and whatnot, right, you know? Um, like I said, I used to be an entrepreneur and I spent a lot of my time when I moved to entrepreneurship, um, you know, reading, right, you know? 
Um, you know, as an entrepreneur, and again, there's going to be a lot of people talking about that. You know, one of the things I, you know, I did a lot when I was within corporates, and I always advise people and professionals is that when you think about the organization that you're in, you cannot be a successful entrepreneur if you have not read the annual report of your company. I promise you it would be the most boring piece of material you would read. <laughs> but I also promise you you'll be better for it. Because the disclosure requirements in that dense piece of material is high. There's a lot of things that are in there, right? You, know, you learn about your company. Are you guys making money or not, right? You know, who are your suppliers? Who are your vendors, right? You know, who's the competition? What is happening? So I always tell people that you, know, you have to read that material. You know, even if you're working within the Nigerian branch of a foreign organization, go to the foreign organization's global website, download it and read it. You have to read this material. You know, another thing is attending the AGMs, right, or logging into investor calls, right? You know, the important thing, the, the reason why that's important is that you start to see some of the pressures that your CEO is under. Remember, you're an entrepreneur, right? Your job, you're trying to create value. And look, we're Nigerians. We're all given into enterprise. You know, a lot of us, you know, yes, I'm working in corporate, but it's not my father's company. I'm just waiting to start my own. But entrepreneurship gives you a comfortable platform to do that, right? You know, and it, it's, it's, it's probably the best ground to prepare for an entrepreneur. And so you go into these AGMs, you're logging into, you know, the, the investor calls. You start to see the pressure that your CEO is under, right? Because in these calls, in these forums, you know, the CEO is being pelted with questions from all the stakeholders, whether it's investors, it's shareholders, it's regulators, right, you know. And then the light bulb starts going off in your head about, you know, why things are the way they are within the organization and where the opportunities are, you know. So it's definitely something that I recommend, especially as an entrepreneur, right, you know. Um, but yes, intellectual curiosity, a practical way of doing this is, is reading, right, you know. Um, and then we also, when we th talk about our roles as entrepreneurs, right, and again, it's, it's, it's carrying that vision. Um, we also think about, look, what's going to drive success? There's a lot of change that has happened in the world, um, you know, recently. There's a lot of complexity that has come up. Um, and determination for me is still that lever for success. Um, it is, the entrepreneurial journey is very tough, right? You know, success is not always logical. It's usually not always about the best idea, or, you know, brilliance, right, you know? And so that determination is important, right? And being within a corporate does not necessarily mean it's easy or whatnot. I mean, you do have the comfort of, you know, the platform or whatnot, but that determination is important, right? Because even within the corporate, where you're trying to drive innovation, you're trying to drive change, you also need to be determined. I mean, I used to, you know, like I said, work within a bank, right? Very regulated industry, right? You know, and I remember some of the times where we tried to drive change, right? And you'll be surprised that just some people within the bank and their job is just to say no. Okay, so we want, and no, no, Yvonne, this is not going to, it's not going to work. No, no, but what? No. You know, at some point in time, one guy said, Yvonne, you know, the CBN Act 14.7 says this thing you are doing is illegal. The Senate can call us. And I was just, I was like, you know, that was his job. But then, you know, at some point in time, I said, let me just leave it. They will cuckoo pay salary next to but then, you, as an entrepreneur, and I'm also running a fintech, I now have to pay attention to that CBN Act 14.7, right? So determination is important, um, you know, for both roles. There is a high frequency of things going wrong. So you have to be comfortable with ambiguity. You have to embrace failure because it's not the end. And so much of your success is not giving up. It's making sure that you're sufficiently determined. And entrepreneurial success, you know, when we think about our roles, we're talking about our roles as entrepreneurs, it's a huge lever towards national success. And Nigeria needs a lot of big wins, right? You know, we, we have huge development wins, right? You know, and so success in this role for you, right, you know, is, is, is big and it's major. So the second thing that we also look at is the future, right? You know, it's uncertain, but we can at least make educated guesses based on trends, right? Because you certainly cannot innovate for a future that you cannot accurately predict. One of the things, like I talked about, your role is, you know, to have that image of the future and really just get people to invest in it, right? You know, so we, you have to be able to make an attempt at, you know, predicting the future. And, you know, it's important to be mostly right about what the future is, right? It's a predictive exercise, right? But you want to be mostly right, right? And, like I said, this is the most practical application of intellectual curiosity because asking the right questions, being curious enough, 
would make sure that that picture of the future that you're predicting um, is as accurate as possible. And there's a higher degree of complexity in today's operating environment, right? You know, the speed of change is scary. It's almost unfair, right? And so when you're thinking about the future and you're asking the right questions and you're trying to paint the future, you want to focus on, you know, the trends that are gaining momentum, right? You want to make sure that you're not just talking about maybe things that maybe just blips, right? You know, what are some of the trends, you know, that are gaining momentum? And there are three that I, in particular, you know, have been focusing on, right? One is geopolitics. Um, the second one is financial markets. And the third, of course, is technology. You can't get away from that, right? And there's been rising geopolitical tensions, right? You know, I mean, the two big elephants are fighting, you know, the U.S. and China. And that has huge implications for all of us. The U.S. is a global superpower, right? You know, China is also number two. Uh, but China is a big trading partner to a lot of our nations, right? You know? And they are now explicitly courting, each other, uh, courting other nations to take sides, right? You know, so that's something that you know, is going to play a role in the future, and we have to be able to pay attention to that, right? You know? uh, financial markets. You know, some of this might seem complex. It might seem like it might not apply to you, but it does, right? You know? So what's happening is that interest rates are higher to combat higher inflation, right? You know? There was an era of low interest rates. Um, and that enabled huge technology innovation, which we benefited from. You know, Chuka just talked about it, right? You know, Nigerian startups and, you know, startups on the continent, uh, we all benefited from, you know, that wave of, you know, um, venture capital funding, a lot of that triggered by low interest rates, right? You know, and so now that some of that has pulled back, it has implications for that. So that's now uh, a part of the future that might be permanent. So you have to think about that. Um, you know, governments also borrowed, um, you know, during this era. And so their inability to refinance at, you know, lower rates has implications, right? You know, when they're cash strapped, you know, they start to think about new ways of raising money, right? That's when new fees and taxes and levies come in, right? You know, so as you're thinking about the future, as you're predicting it, as you're curious about it, right, these are some of the things that, you know, they're likely to show up, right? And you have to start to think about that, the implications of that. Um, inflation, you know, it's a monster that no one wants, right, you know. It decreases the purchasing power of money, right. Your costs go up, you know, consumer demand comes down, right. I mean, it doesn't get more direct than that when you think about the implications of the future. So again, you know, just thinking about, you know, predicting the future, right, because remember, you know, my argument is that you have to be curious enough about it so that the picture of the future that you're creating is as accurate as possible, right? So that you can innovate for it, right? You know? And lastly, it's technology. We can't get away from it. You know, it's, it's, it's an amazing lever. It has demonstrated the power to improve humanity. And it's arguably the biggest lever in driving innovation, right? You know, when you talk about innovating for the future, technology is going to play a role. Um, and your curiosity about technology is a decent framework for predicting the future. There is a 100% chance that an existing technology has impacted your business, whether you see it or you do not see it. And there is a 100% chance that an emerging technology is coming to impact your business, whether you see it or not, right? So you have to be curious about technology. What are some of the trends happening, right? And how do you predict you know, the implications on your business? Um, again, three that I think about, you know, often that I'm curious about. Electric vehicles, semiconductors, and AI. You know, we, there's been a lot of talk about climate change, and one of the main drivers of climate change is carbon emissions, right? We need to transition to renewable energy. We need to transition to, you know, cleaner fuels, right? And so what that means is that electric vehicles are certainly a part of the future. We're seeing enough of that to be able to say, yes, they're going to be a big part of the future. And when you think about electric vehicles, right, you know, there's two key materials that go into the batteries of those vehicles, right? It's nickel and it's lithium, right? And that has implications on the entire value chain in terms of processing and mining. So you are in the oil and gas servicing business, right? Intellectual curiosity means you have a research analyst that is just focused on what is happening in those things, how it affects you. You can keep doing your oil and gas, but you have to be curious enough about how these things, because you are seeing nations now that are explicitly protecting their advantage. You know, Chile is one of the largest sources of lithium, and they recently nationalized their industry. You know, Indonesia has banned the export of raw um, nickel, right? You know, so you have to be curious enough about it because there's, there's a chance it's going to be part of the future. Semiconductors, you know, 
Um, the reason why they're important is that they're the foundation of modern electronics, right? You know, all of the devices that we're all holding have semiconductors in them, right? You know, and nations, again, are now classifying these as strategic sectors. China already has a dominance. The U.S. has aggressively passed policies, about $400 billion, that include subsidies protecting this industry. I mean, the World Trade Organization is up in arms, and the U.S. is like, you guys can sit down and do whatever you're doing, right? So again, this is going to be part of the future, right? And finally, there's AI, right? It's, it's not a question, right? It, it is, it's, it's, it's going to be part of the future. Intellectual curiosity means that you should be interacting with an AI model, right, and finding out how well it does your job. Just sit there. If you haven't done so, you should, right, you know, Sit down and say, the last report that you have to write, ask the AI model to write it for you. The last Excel that you had to analyze, put it into an AI model and ask it to analyze it for you. If you are in marketing, the last marketing campaign that you just ask the AI model to put it into for you, right? Because you want, you need to be curious enough about how well this AI job and models do your job, right? because then you start a, gl a glimpse of the future and start to innovate around that, right? I mean, I run a technology company. I, you know, and part of my, we had an all hands meeting and so, you know, I asked questions that how many of you are using an AI model, right, in your jobs, right? And everybody had their hands up, right? You know? So we started asking questions, okay, tell me how you're using it, tell me how you're using it. And it was interesting because a lot of the software engineers, right, like, and they gave me this code to write. I didn't know how to write it, so I just put it inside the AI model. Well, I was writing this code, and there was a bug, and I didn't know how to, so I just put it inside the AI model. It was very clear that these software engineers had shaved off at least an hour of their time. In fact, one of them, his cheeks were very big because he just, he's, he has time on his hands, right? Now, intellectual curiosity for me means I need to fill up that gap. Right? I mean, I asked another one a question, oh, something, something. It was like, oh, Yvonne, thanks for the question. This is what the AI model said. Ah, is AI paying your salary? So he just typed it in and gave me. But again, you have to be curious enough about it, right? Because it is part of the future, right? You know, so that's what intellectual curiosity means, right? And so in predicting the future, again, you have to be curious enough about it, right? What are the trends that are gaining momentum, right? What are you reading, right? You know, which raw materials are you supplying to improve the quality of your questions? And then thirdly, we're looking at the opportunities, right? You know, now that we've clarified what our role is, we see how change is happening, complexity is happening. You know, we have a framework in terms of being able to predict the future and not, right? And now it's looking at the actual innovation, where are the opportunities, right? You know, um, and it's all context specific. We're all in different industries, we're in different functions. If you're an entrepreneur, you're in different functions and whatnot, right? So there's a lot of different frameworks to look at that. But, you know, as an entrepreneur, you have to have a decent image of the future and which opportunities are you focused on, right? You know, as a visionary, you structured your life to be able to um, spot those opportunities early. Um, but as you consider opportunities, right, you know, there's three things um, to consider, right, when you kind of analyze opportunities and maybe you're ranking them um, in some sort of order. Um, you know, one is the advantage we still have in this market because of the huge development need um, in our market. You know, Chuka just talked about it. There is no shortage of problems, right, you know. Um, and so that should never be a blocker. Our citizens still need a lot more peace and prosperity in their futures. And as entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs, how do we create that, right, you know? So there's no shortage of opportunities, right? Um, number two, deglobalization is creeping in, right, for different reasons. When supply chains were broken during COVID, people started to look inwards, right? But global supply chains will still exist, right, you know? And so things are constantly still moving around. Um, and so one of the things when you're analyzing and thinking about the opportunities and innovation is to say, look, can I find a big reason for a company to come here, right, to be able to localize their supply chain? There's an interesting story of the woman that helped Apple to domesticate their phone screens in China, you know. Um, Chinese entrepreneur, she started her career actually as a factory worker and went on to build a su um, successful businesses. Um, but her major success came because she was able to supply the glass, you know, when phones started changing from plastic to glass, the glass touchscreens for Apple, she was able to help them do that. And that was kind of a major win for her, right? You know? So yes, if you think about op opportunities, you know, global supply chain, things are still moving around. Can you find a reason for somebody to come and domesticate? Um, 
And the third thing is that we still have a huge advantage with our demographic, right? Sometime this year, if it hasn't already happened, um, India would overtake China as the most populous country in the world. And that's major, right, you know? India has held that title since 1950, I think, right? But that's not the big deal. The big deal is the demographic advantage India has over China. So younger population, higher fertility rates, lower infant mortality. And so you put this together, and then you see that they have a lot more upside in terms of economic development. In fact, there's another interesting statistic where the proportion of women in, in business or in, in the working uh, population in India is lower than China. So huge upside. But then when you look at these things, it, it feels familiar, right? Because in Nigeria, we still have those same advantage, you know, bringing it home here. So when you think about opportunities, you can't forget that advantage that we have, right? And specifically improving the quality of that capital. And I say this with full knowledge of the Jack Ma movement, which is still going to persist, right? Just because other countries, you know, don't have this demographic advantage that we have. And quite frankly, they just have to pull for markets like ours. That's the only way that they can survive, right? Um, but even with that happening, right, I'm very convinced that, you know, when you consider opportunities, it is safe bet to say, we have this demographic advantage, how do I exploit that in the opportunities that I'm considering, right? Nigeria just becomes more attractive to capital just because our talent is, you know, maybe 10% better or 15% better, right? You know, you can hire people to do basic tasks without a lot of reskilling, right? right? It's also important to consider the risks, right? We're entrepreneurs, we embrace the ambiguity, we're comfortable with these risks, right? Um, and like I said, the pace of complexity and change um, is scary. Um, five years ago, you could have, or 10 years ago, you could have invested in heavily in training maybe an army of cheaper software engineers to serve a global market, right? Chuka talked a lot of, about those companies. I invested in a few of them, right? And all of a sudden we wake up and AI has advanced so fast that, you know, um, it almost feels like it could start to commoditize that skill, right? You know? And so what that means is that, yes, we still have a huge advantage in our market in Nigeria and Africa, right? But as an entrepreneur, you have to be executing quicker and technology also has to be a part of that. So let's wrap this up and try to, you know, put this all together. Right? We're, in, we're talking about innovating for the future. You know, we're sitting down here as entrepreneurs, intrapreneurs, right? You know? And my argument is that intellectual curiosity is a big framework for being able to innovate for that future that you see. Um, the operating environment in Nigeria, it's tough on a normal day. And you know, one of the things that I think about is, you know, the current geopolitical challenges means that we face the risk that history happens to us, you know, without, you know, a lot of control over that. And so the stakes are much higher as an entrepreneur in Nigeria and Africa, you know, even more so. Your success is much more than just you, right? And Nigeria, we, like I said, we need some big successes. We need a lot more large-scale enterprises. We need to show the world that we can do bigger things, right? But entrepreneurs, we're the set of people that are built to do so. Your determination, your adaptability is needed now more than ever. The ability to just keep going, you know, change course when things don't always work out. Embracing failure because you know it's not the end, right? And your ability to create value is a function of painting an accurate picture of the future and exploiting the opportunities uh, that you spot. And intellectual curiosity is a proven lever to spot those gaps earlier than others. So stay curious. Let's keep this Ameba going. Thank you. Jemari, senior pastor at the Covenant Nation, and also the convener of the platform Nigeria.